So first of all, I want to introduce you to what naturopathic medicine is and who naturopathic doctors are for those of you that don't know uh, much about us. So uh, a naturopathic doctor, and this is, there are also practitioners who use the title traditional naturopath or naturopathic practitioner, and these backgrounds are going to be a little bit different. Um, so to be a naturopathic doctor, you have to go to an accredited naturopathic school, and to do that, you have to do all the same pre-med requirements that medical doctors have to do. And Karen, you can go to the first slide. Um, so at naturopathic medical school, we learn all the nuts and bolts of how to be a doctor. So how to diagnose and treat, how the body works and whatnot. But then we also do additional cor coursework in botanical medicine, homeopathy, counseling, a wonderful modality called hydrotherapy, we do a lot of nutrition, and then we do naturopathic physical medicine as well. Um, so many people think, okay, this is going to be like seeing a medical doctor, but you're going to swap out some herbs and some nutraceuticals for pharmaceuticals. But the experience and the approach is actually quite different from that. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay, great. So the experience of seeing a naturopathic doctor can look pretty different than it does seeing other doctors. And that starts off with the time that we're spending with patients. And I know most doctors would love to have more time with their patients, but it doesn't work in the, in the current model that we have for medicine. So when I meet a patient for the first time, we're usually spending a couple hours together because I don't want to know just about the symptoms that you're experiencing related to scleroderma. I want to have time to look at the whole picture. So that's going to include how you're sleeping, how your energy level is like, what your menstrual cycle is like. Um, There's just this whole systemic approach to looking at a person. And that's because I can never limit myself to just treating a disease or just treating symptoms. I look at that, that whole person and I find that to be the best way in making changes in chronic disease. There's also a lot of individualization to our treatment plans. So every patient is going to have a lot of variation in their treatment plan. Because uh, again, I'm not treating just the name of the disease or the scleroderma, but each individual and their unique expression of that and their unique underlying causes. We also have a really big toolkit. Uh, and one of the biggest differences is the guiding philosophy that we work under. So one of those is that your body has this innate ability and this innate desire to heal. Uh, and our job as uh, doctors is to guide you in how to remove obstacles to that healing and how to give the body the right information to heal. We also work a lot on um, something we call terrain. Um, and that is essentially the environment of your body with that. Uh, and I'm always, one of my guiding philosophies is always continuing to ask, ask the question why for every patient. Um, when we think we have an answer, continue to ask why to get at the deeper and deeper root cause of a person's imbalance or dysfunction. Okay, can I go to the next slide? So when I approach autoimmunity, I think about four major areas that I want to treat and how I approach these and the details of each one, again, is going to be different from person to person. The first thing I do with all patients with chronic disease, whether it's an autoimmune condition, um, specifically scleroderma or something else, is to set the foundations for healing. So one really important approach that naturopathic doctors take to disease is we build health in the body as well as treating disease. So the thing that we find is that the more health we build in the body, the less room there is for disease. So we don't need to just treat that disease specifically, but build health. And that is really what these foundations are about. So that's going to be things like how you're eating, how you're moving your body, your habits that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, this sort of thing. Then I also work on balancing the immune system. So as I'm sure most of you know, when you have an autoimmune condition, usually one part of your immune system is overactive and the other part is underactive and we want to balance that out. We can, there are different nutraceuticals that we can use to do that. So nutraceuticals are um, a little bit like a pharmaceutical, but they're made for nutrients and, and non-prescriptive. Uh, there are also things that we can do in our day-to-day -day habits um, that help balance that and in our diet as well. Uh, the third thing I want to do is do my best to 
um, remove the fuel for things that might be uh, fueling the autoimmune process with that. And so that can be different from individual to individual. Often I find in autoimmunity that there's there are things in the gut fueling the disease. So again, that could be foods that we're eating, that could be a bacterial balance in the gut. So not just SIBO, but imbalances of the normal bacteria. Um, there can be issues with the gut lining that exposes the immune system to things that it shouldn't be. Those are some examples of how the digestive tract can be involved in that. Sometimes there can be toxicities, there can be stress, um, mental emotional stresses that can be fueling that as well. So we want to identify those and work with those specifically. And then we want to stimulate your body's uh, ability to heal, that innate desire to heal as well. So those are the four main areas that I'm thinking about and looking at when I'm first approaching autoimmunity in a patient. Okay, great, thank you, right on cue there. So today I wanna to uh, speak specifically about reducing inflammation and reducing inflammation really helps with three of those areas. So reducing inflammation, when, when we really work on those foundations of health, we're gonna be reducing inflammation. When we balance the immune system, it reduces inflammation. And when we remove fuel for inflammation, um, we remove inflammation as well. So we're gonna talk about some of those fuels today, ways to balance the immune system, and then some foundations. And these, these five action areas and their sub-actions that I'm gonna speak about, a lot of them seem stunningly simple, like too simple to impact your scleroderma, but I can, I hate to make promises with medicine and outcomes and things like that because you never know what's going to come up. But I, I can almost promise you that if you make foundational lifestyle changes, you're going to see your disease modify, that they will have a big impact on that. So we don't need to just think about what do we do about the symptoms? Like what do we do about the, the Raynaud's or what do we do about the reflux symptoms, but what do we do to modify the larger picture of inflammation and set foundations for health in your body? And many times that will modify those other factors and those other symptoms. Okay, let's have the next slide. Okay, so first of all, what is inflammation? That word gets thrown around a lot. Inflammation is technically when the immune system sends out inflammatory cells and chemicals in response to microbes and damaged tissues. So when inflammation is in response to something acute, so that could be an infection like flu or a cold, or this could be an injury like a sprained ankle, inflammation is really productive and it's really good. When inflammation becomes chronic and it's not necessarily in response to a microbe or an acute injury, that's when we run into problems and chronic disease happens in the body. So every single chronic disease, every single autoimmune condition has inflammation as the base in it. So this is relevant to every single one of you and any of your, your family and, and friends that may be listening to this as well, because we know that all the other major chronic diseases that we deal with in the U.S. have inflammation as a foundation to it. Um, so we can see inflammation on blood work, measuring things like C-reactive protein and homocysteine, ferritin, a number of other markers, but we can also experience it in our symptoms. So symptoms of inflammation could be pain and swelling, it could be stiffness, it could be brain fog, it could be fatigue. These are all symptoms of inflammation. And there are many more, that was just a handful. But anytime you have an autoimmune condition that's active, you know there's inflammation in the body. And when we talk about, you can actually go to the next slide, that would be great. So when we talk about reducing inflammation, certainly I use with patients things like anti-inflammatory herbs and supplements and whatnot, but I can give you the very best supplements for reducing inflammation on the earth. But if you're not setting the foundations in your lifestyle, they're really not going to make the impact. These lifestyle areas have a much, much bigger impact than anything you can take. Truly, I've seen really amazing things happen. So we're going to talk about removing a handful of inflammatory foods, increasing nutrients and foods that fight inflammation, how to hydrate properly, a few tips on how to support good gut bacteria, and then I'm also going to touch on breathing, but just from a little bit of a different angle with this. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. 
So removing pro-inflammatory foods. I've listed just the top four here that I want you to think about removing. And many of you might already be doing this. So I hope the information isn't too basic. The top two areas that I touch on here are things that are actually inflammatory for everyone. This isn't unique to scleroderma or unique to autoimmunity, but these, these two areas create inflammation in anybody's body. So the first one is what we call industrial seed oils. So this will be canola, corn, soy, safflower, and anything that's labeled as, as vegetable oil or industrial seed oils. And these create a lot of inflammation in the body. Um, I was listening to a podcast recently that was saying that 20% of the average American's diet, their calories come from these industrial seed oils. And when you hear that, you can see why we have so much chronic disease in our country. One big factor in it is the dietary inclusion of these industrial seed oils. So why are these inflammatory? There, there are a few reasons why they're inflammatory. So these are really rich in a type of fatty acid called omega-6s. And omega-6s in and of themselves aren't harmful. They can do productive things in the body, but the modern diet has a lot of omega-6s in it and it doesn't have as many omega-3s. And this creates an inflammatory imbalance in the body. We wanna turn that table and get more omega-3s, which we'll talk about on the next slide, and fewer omega-6s. Um, second, these oils go rancid very quickly, and anything that we put in our body that's rancid is going to feed inflammation. So these, the rancidity with these actually start when they're being produced. The process that these seeds go through to be made into an oil already starts to alter them and, and make them rancid and inflammatory. Then we, these tend to get stored in these clear plastic containers that sit on the shelf in the grocery store, and the lights the breakdown from the light and the plastic for, furthers that rancidity in them. Uh, and then often we're eating these in the form, not always, but sometimes eating these in the form of things that are fried. And then that high heat can create more inflammation and more rancidity and whatnot. So these are a wonderful thing to remove from your diet. That can sometimes be easy to do at home. You can swap them out for things like a good quality olive oil, um, avocado oil, coconut oil, a good quality butter can all be good home substitutions. Uh, but a lot of people are exposed to these in packaged foods and then in when they go out to eat because many restaurants use these oils. They're cheap and they have low flavor. So they're definitely used across the board in fast food, but um, many sit down restaurants do it as well. Uh, the next thing to think about is the type of sweeteners that you're eating. So white and brown sugar tending to be highly refined can fuel inflammation. So can artificial sweeteners. So that would be things like aspartame and high fruct fructose corn syrup as well. So the high fructose corn syrup has this problem of not only being a very concentrated sweetener, but the corn can be quite inflammatory itself for many people. Um, so you can sub these out for natural sweeteners like honey and maple syrup, and those are much better for the body because they have a lot of minerals and vitamins in them. Um, but if you eat a lot of honey and brown sugar all day long, any level of sweetener, whether it is uh, natural or, or I'm going to say unrefined, not just natural, but unrefined, or whether it's refined white sugar, if you're doing it in large amounts, that's going to feed inflammation as well. So in general, we want to do our best to move away from a lot of uh, sugary and sweetened foods as much as we can to keep inflammation down. The third one is gluten, which I'm sure many of you have heard that before, that gluten really fuels many autoimmune conditions. Um, I would say maybe in my 15 years of seeing patients, only a handful of autoimmune patients that I've had have not been reactive to gluten. So if you haven't taken that, that out, that's a big one. Uh, but I really wanna caution you not to just make gluten-free substitutions. So that would be taking out the gluten-free bread or taking out wheat bread, taking out wheat cereals, uh, pastas, and then substituting them from the gluten-free form. Those foods tend to be really highly refined 
and the the highly refined nature of them will take a lot of nutrients out of your body and then you're eating them in place of foods that have more nutrient value that could be healing your body with that um, Okay, and then dairy. So dairy is another one uh, that I find most of my autoimmune patients react to. And it's not every type of dairy. A lot of people can still tolerate butter, I find, quite well. Um, but other forms of dairy can create a lot of inflammation. And this is going to vary individual to individual, because if you tolerate dairy, it can have a lot of good nutrient values, but it can also be um, quite inflammatory. Those are probably the top four areas that I see with people. There's certainly other, um, other foods that I will have people do a trial elimination of to see what is inflammatory for an individual. Because we some foods, as I said, with the industrial seed oils and certain types of sweeteners, those are pretty much inflammatory across the board. But there are other foods that are just inflammatory for some people. And some of them can be quite healthy. Um, like eggs are a food that can be really inflammatory for a lot of people with uh, autoimmune conditions, tomatoes are another, uh, but those aren't across the board. And if you tolerate them, they have really a lot of nutrients in them. I encourage all of my autoimmune patients when we start treatment to do some form of an elimination diet, because that will help you narrow down what's inflammatory for you. And it can be really empowering and make a huge difference for people. So on my website, I have um, access to a guide, a free guide of the elimination diet that I use with people, and it'll walk you through it step by step and the ins and outs. So if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about that, you, you can jump onto that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I like to really emphasize not just foods that we're going to eliminate, but what we can increase to build health in the body because nutrient density is just as important as taking out inflammatory foods. That being said, oftentimes if you have foods in your diet that are very inflammatory, you may not notice the value of the nutrient dense foods. So there are two things that really go hand in hand. So I've listed a few nutrients here and these nutrients are not just generally anti-inflammatory, but they actually balance the immune response as well. So they can help balance out that tendency towards autoimmunity. And that's going to be omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin A and vitamin E. So omega-3 fatty acids can be found in cod liver oil. That is a supplement that I love to use across the board with everyone. And I really specifically love cod liver oil itself versus uh, just an omega supplement or a fish oil supplement. And I love the cod liver because it's, it's essentially a whole food. It's really a food more than a supplement. And it has some natural vitamin A and vitamin D in it. I'm very picky about the fish oils and cod liver oils that I like people to have. So I'm just going to throw out there that I really love Carlson's cod liver oil as a high quality option that has been tested for um, rancidity and things like metals and other, other toxins that can sometimes be found in fish. So that's a great high quality one. There, I'm not going to recommend a lot of specific supplements in this because there are so many contraindications and I feel that a lot of them should be used in conjunction with a practitioner. You know, as um, Dr. Hinchcliffe mentioned earlier, probiotics may not be a good choice for, for everyone, even though they seem really benign. And that can be true of, of a lot of supplements too. Um, but cod liver oil, I find, doesn't have a lot of contraindications. The one that I can think of off the top of my head is if you're on a blood thinner, that dosing on the blood thinner may need to be adjusted being on a cod liver oil or omega or a fish oil because they have pretty good um, blood thinning properties with them. Cod liver oil, can you can get a flavored one, so it doesn't taste like, um, it doesn't, it doesn't taste like uh, liver or like cod at all. Fatty fish in general are a good way to increase omega-3s. So this is going to be things like salmon, mackerel, sardines. Sardines are one of the foods that I'm always trying to get people to eat more of, but isn't so common in the standard American diet, but it's a great one for nutrients. And then any type of pasture-raised meats and eggs. So when a cow or a chicken is dining on green grass, they are going to get more omegas in their diet and that's going to translate into the meat and the eggs. Um, and that can make a big difference in the omega-3 balance. 
Sometimes you will hear that flaxseed, hemp seed are both good sources of omega-3s, but they're not actually great direct sources of omega-3s. Your body has to do a lot of converting to get them into omega-3s. And on top of that, I will sometimes find that um, people with autoimmune conditions can be a little reactive to seeds at times too. So I like to go for these more direct sources of omega-3s. Vitamin A is another really key nutrient for balancing the immune system. And I find that many, many people are, I'm not gonna say deficient in vitamin A, but really suboptimal in vitamin A. So I mentioned earlier that cod liver oil is a great uh, source of vitamin A. Liver in general is a great source of vitamin A, another food that I'm always trying to get patients to eat, which is a hit or miss endeavor for me. Um, but there are lots of ways that you can prepare this that can be really enjoyable. So some of it could be sneaking it into like ground hamburger meat or a meatloaf. Um, I actually like to make it into dairy-free pâtés and I freeze them in little individual servings. And that can be uh, grab it from the freezer in the morning, pair it with some plantain chips and some vegetables and it makes a really quick lunch. Um, so those can be good ways to do the liver. If you absolutely don't think you can eat it since it's such a different palate for us, um, I will prescribe desiccated liver caps for patients too. So this is actually beef or chicken liver that has been dehydrated and put in a cap form. Um, you do wanna be careful with the source that you get of that. Uh, you want it to be essentially a grass from a grass fed um, cow or chicken for the best quality on that. Grass-fed butter can also be a great source of vitamin A, and then pasture-raised egg yolks. So again, be a little cautious with the butter and the eggs because I do find that sometimes autoimmune patients will be reactive to those. Eggs are one of the top five food sensitivities, but these are also really nutrient-dense foods. So when I do an elimination diet with a patient, often butter, if I've taken that out, and then eggs are some of the first things that I have people reintroduce because I really want them to have that source of vitamin A in their diet. If you do a little internet search for sources of vitamin A, you're going to come across all kinds of misleading lists. Many of the lists will say things like carrots and sweet potatoes, and these actually have absolutely no vitamin A in it. They have a vitamin A precursor, but to make that precursor into vitamin A, you have to have really good thyroid function, you have to have really healthy gut, and you have to have the right genetics. So it takes all of that to get the vitamin A out of them. It's much better to get a direct source of preformed vitamin A from some of the sources that I've listed here. Vitamin E is another really important nutrient, especially if you've had a diet that has a lot of those industrial seed oils in it, you're gonna recover and heal from that much faster by increasing vitamin D in the diet. Sometimes I'll have people do it as a supplement. Um, if I do that, I really want to make sure that they take uh, the form of vitamin E called tocotrienols, as that's, that's shown to be the best form for people. Sunflower seeds and sunflower butter are great sources of vitamin E. If you're getting sunflower butter, do read the label because a lot of it can have those, um, I have a hydrogenated oil in it or one of those industrial seed oils. Um, and they can also have sugar in them too. Palm oil, red palm oil is another great source. And then grass-fed animal products in general are gonna be higher in vitamin E too. So those can all be great sources of vitamin E. Adding lots of spices to your diet can be a really great way to reduce inflammation. Most spices have some type of anti-inflammatory property to them, some more than others. So ginger is a great choice. Oops, I think we lost the slideshow there, Karen. I'm, gonna, I'm going to keep talking. Ginger is a great choice that can be included in cooking. It can also be made into a tea. I love getting fresh ginger and grating it and boiling it into a tea. Um, the next thing I have on there is turmeric. I bet many of you have heard of doing turmeric as a supplement and that can be great, but I also like just having people uh, included in their diets. That could be adding um, turmeric to uh, vegetables. It could be doing a little bit of a curry sauce with the turmeric and the ginger. It could be doing a turmeric latte instead of coffee in the morning. Those can be great ways to get it in. And then I like those more common culinary spices that we use, uh, basil, oregano, thyme, marjoram. These are all very nutrient dense. Spices in general have a lot of nutrients in them. So I really encourage people 
to add, add them in abundance to what they're eating and making. You may have noticed um, earlier when candy bactin was mentioned that it includes a lot of these essential oils from these same plants, thyme, oregano, things like that. So including a lot of these in the diet can actually be really protective for, um, for the digestive tract and digestive health here as well as systemic inflammation. So you can do them fresh, you can do them dried. If you do them dried, make sure that they smell good and that the color is bright so that you're not getting old spices there, but really increasing spices. The spice that I would give caution for in autoimmunity are the pepper spices. So this could be as run of the mill as black pepper, but also cayenne and other pepper spices. Sometimes people with autoimmune conditions don't tolerate peppers very well, being part of the nightshade family. That's not across the board, um, but that is one of those things that will eliminate in a full-on elimination diet for autoimmunity and then work those back in and see if you tolerate them or not. The last thing is just to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. As Americans, we tend to eat a handful of, of fruits and vegetables. So we love bananas, apples, um, tomatoes, white potatoes, and corn tend to make up the bulk of what we eat in those areas. Um, several of those are, are things that people with autoimmune conditions can have issues with, the potatoes, the tomatoes, the corn. Again, not across the board, but a lot of people. And it also keeps our nutrient profile really, um, yes, I see there's a comment, black pepper is not part of the nightshade family. That, that's true, it's not part of the nightshade family, but it is one that people with autoimmunity do, do react to. So in a classic autoimmune elimination diet, it, it is taken out. Again, it's not across the board, but for a lot of people, you do. Um, okay, sorry, I just, thought I, I just saw that pop up and thought I would address it. Um, Let's see, I was talking about the fruits and vegetables. Most fruits and vegetables have different compounds in them that are anti-inflammatory. So it's really important to get a variety of them in the diet. Um, we know that some of the healthiest gut profiles um, include diets that have, I've seen a study that said 30 different types of fruits and vegetables per week in the diet, which sounds like a, a lot, but that can actually include things like the spices. So my caveat with that is, if you suddenly uh, increase a bunch of fruits and vegetables in your diet and your digestion doesn't feel good, you might actually have that bacterial overgrowth that was mentioned earlier because the fruits and vegetables are fiber that bacteria feed on. And when your bacteria is too high in the small intestine, you can get symptoms of bloating and things like that. And so one of the hallmarks that I think about um, with, with bacterial overgrowth is if a patient says my digestion is better when I eat a lot of highly processed foods, they very likely have SIBO because they're taking, um, they're taking out of the diet a lot of the fiber with that. Um, did, I'm not seeing the slide presentation anymore. Karen, is that still up? Is, are other people seeing it? No, no, you guys aren't seeing it either. Okay. I have a pretty good idea again. I of think what's I'm on the next having, slide. I'm having okay. trouble too. Can okay, great. See it now? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say if worse comes to worse, I can probably do it from memory, but it's nice for people <laughs> to have the images with that. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is hydration, which it seems very basic, although I'm constantly surprised by the number of patients that just say on the first uh, visit, I know I'm not drinking enough water, right? Because it should be pretty simple to get some water in, right? A pretty simple habit, but it's not for everybody. But what I found over time is that it's really not just about getting water in, that hydration actually takes more than that. We can drink plain water, all day long and still be dehydrated. And water is really important for reducing inflammation on a number of fronts. One is water is what helps your body move out waste and toxins. And that can be as simple as through sweat and urine, but it's also how your body cleanses and, and rebalances the extracellular fluid, which is the stuff surrounding your cells there. Um, there are also places that hydration is particularly important for scleroderma. So when we talk about the skin health and elasticity, what but also, 
<laughs> things like it, lo it looks fine to me Karen I don't know what it's doing on your end but oh, it looks fine I, to me it, I'm totally black oh is it black for anybody else or can people see the slides oh it disappeared okay somebody can see the slides but some people can't okay you can you can okay We'll, we'll stay here for a second. Mm -hmm. um, so as I was mentioning, you know, hyd hydration is important for everybody and in reducing inflammation and feeling our best, but there are some areas that are um, particularly of concern with chloroderma. So things like how our, our skin quality and health and, um, you know, for many of you, the production of saliva and other secretions in the body too. So Karen, when you get it back, you can go to the next slide that has that image of it on it. Uh, so how we hydrate is, okay, the slides, sorry, it's getting a little confusion. The slides are visible for some people. I'm going to wait just a second here. Okay, I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to keep talking so I can respect everybody's time here and not have so many pauses. Uh, so hydration is not just about drinking water, and it's not just about drinking eight cups of water or half your body weight in ounces of water. I do like that as a general format, except I'm going to say half your body weight in ounces of hydrating fluids because we can drink things besides water that is hydrating. So when you get a glass of water that you've taken from the tap or you've taken from your fancy water filter, that water, if you really think about the experience of drinking it, it's very flat and it's not very, I'm going to say structured. And with that flatness and that lack of structure, it's not actually very hydrating to your body. If any of you have had the experience of drinking from a stream or drinking from well water, that water tastes very different in the mouth. And it's because of all the minerals are giving it a really structured quality to it. And when water has that structure, it's it's much more hydrating and much more healing for the body. So by adding structure back to your water, you can get a lot more hydration out of it. And this, this sounds like the silliest little tip that wouldn't do anything, but I can't tell you how many patients have told me that this was a game changer for them. I want you to try simply with your water, adding a pinch of sea salt to it, to each cup of water that you have. And this can be a Himalayan salt, it can be sea salt that's gray, or it can be sea salt that's pink. Um, not, not that picky about the source of it, but I want it to be a natural salt. And I want it to be just a pinch. Um, the water shouldn't taste salty, but it should taste more rounded. So you can do a little experiment with this this afternoon and get your regular tap or filtered water and then do the same thing with a pinch of sea salt and see how the mouthfeel is different in the water. And that water is going to be more hydrating for you. You can also add um, drops of trace minerals, which is a great idea too. I love a brand called Concentrate Trace Minerals. That's a good way to get that round feel into the water to and replace minerals, which most people are deficient in. Um, a good quality electrolyte can be something to use, especially if you're in a hot climate, you're sweating a lot, you're exercising. The, I guess I am gonna throw out a few brands here. Uh, I love LMNT electrolytes. They don't have any added sweeteners to them and nothing artificial. So they're an awesome, awesome way to go. Um, Karen, I did lose the slides again. I'm just gonna keep going. Um, but if you can get them up, that would be great so that I don't, I don't skip anything on here. Uh, let me see. I had a quick question about the sea salt and I think I'll jump in and answer that. Um, will it help improve saliva in the mouth? Uh, so I think it helps people. I think it helps improve secretions because you're going to be hydrating your cells better and that helps with being able pr to produce more saliva as well. So give it a try. I think it could be really helpful for that. Um, so we can hydrate in ways besides plain water that we add minerals or salt or electrolytes to. We can also hydrate from natural mineral waters. Uh, so that could be something like Pellegrino, could be a good one, a good choice there. Um, you can also get it from broths. So the nature of broths, they have a lot of structure to them. They're very hydrating. Smoothies can do it. Fresh pressed vegetables, juices can do it. Those can all be really hydrating. You can also make your warm beverages more hydrating, like teas and coffee, um, by adding a little bit of fat to them. So a healthy fat, like a 
uh, coconut oil or an MCT oil or a little of that grass-fed butter, which might sound horrible to you guys, but it can, it can really be quite good, even especially if you blend them up. Um, the caveat I'm going to say with that is I don't love caffeinated beverages for people with scleroderma specifically. A lot of times when I do elimination diets, I'll use coffee as my leverage with people. Like if you can eliminate everything else, you can keep your cup of coffee, but I don't love that so much because in many people, it does cause a lot of constricting of those small vessels. So I know I'm, I'm a caffeine sensitive person. And if I have a full cup of something caffeinated, my fingers will get very cold. So it's something to think about for those of you that have trouble with circulation into your fingers that can make a big difference there. Um, when one type of fresh juice that I would recommend, it's actually beet juice. So uh, somebody mentioned, uh, do, do interventions for erectile dysfunction help with rainouts? And um, beet juice is actually something that's been shown to help with erectile dysfunction. And I found that it can be helpful pe for people with rainouts too with that. Um, Okay, I think I covered all hydration without looking at my slides. I think I covered those aspects of things. I did have another question in here. The brand of electrolytes is LMNT. LMNT. So that's a good one. It's pretty strong. You're probably going to have to start out with just sprinkling a little bit in your water, but that's great. It's great. It's really hydrating. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about was some very basic tips around your gut bacteria. And this is an interesting one because um, this already came up a little bit today in talk talking about SIBO. Um, gut health is incredibly important to autoimmune conditions. Remember that eight, if you remember, or this might be a new thing, that 80% of your immune system actually resides in the walls of the gut. So the health of the gut has a huge modulation on um, the activity of autoimmune conditions. So one thing that I'm often recommending to patients is to increase fermented foods. You know, sometimes I see a problem with SIBO and fermented foods, but not usually. I, I, I think you'd have to be very hard pressed in eating fermented foods to cause a bacterial overgrowth situation. Um, once in a while, I'll see uh, an issue with fermented foods in, in a condition called histamine intolerance, but I don't see a lot of overlap with that in scleroderma. Um, Fermented foods are, uh, you know, traditionally made fruits and vegetables that use bacteria to preserve them, essentially. And that bacteria are a type of probiotic for the gut. Um, and I, I, a number of years ago, maybe like the year before COVID, I was at a conference and there was a gut researcher from Stanford there. And she was super excited to tell us about this study that she did. And it was a small study. But she said, I thought, I thought this thing about fermented foods was just an urban myth, right? That they didn't really do anything. And she did measurements of people's inflammatory markers, systemic inflammatory markers, as well as looking at um, gut health markers. And then she asked the participants to just eat lots of fermented foods, just eat as much as they could. And they ate a lot. It was an average, I think, of seven servings a day, which is a lot. Um, and after doing that for, I think it was several months, they came back and they relooked at inflammatory markers and they relooked at the gut health and it had improved with that simple intervention of adding the fermented foods with it. I wouldn't recommend that you today just like go out and eat seven servings of fermented food. I think your gut is going to feel pretty rocky and rolly with that, but maybe started with just one serving with one meal a day and kind of building up. My general recommendation is aiming for um, one serving with each meal. So a fermented food could be a yogurt. Again, you might do, great, I am about to do examples. So a yogurt could be a fermented food um, with that. And I would suggest doing an organic, full fat yogurt if you're gonna do a dairy one, but there are also some, some good ones out on the market that are non-dairy. So I love Kalina and GTs for coconut-based ones really clean ingredients and good tasting. The GTs is actually so fermented that sometimes when you open it up, it bubbles out. So lots lots of goodness happening in there. Um, fermented foods, I'm gonna give a few more examples, but it reminded me that I wanted to say that fermented foods are not just about the bacteria, but actually when those bacteria work on the foods, they increase minerals and vitamins for you. So you're getting uh, extra vitamin and mineral boost with the fermented foods. Um, other examples could be pickles or sauerkraut. But when you buy these store-bought, I want you to read the label and make sure that you're getting 
not um, not a quick pickle, but you're getting a true fermented foods. So quick pickles are super popular right now. You see them on a lot of restaurant menus. Quick pickles are made using vinegar and sugar to get the texture and the flavor. A real ferment is going to be the vegetable. It's gonna be salt, it's gonna be water, maybe other spices and sometimes sodium chloride as a preservative. And so that's what you're looking for on the label. Uh, one of my go-to brands for that is, um, is Bubby's. Uh, they make great pickles and great, uh, great sauerkraut. So those are examples of, of things that you can go to with that. Um, you can also get kombucha can be another one, but I would recommend really mixing it around between kombucha and the fruits and the vegetables because sometimes kombucha can be high in sugar. I think they taste caffeinated too. And so that again can be a reason not to do too much of it. Um, Okay, so other things for minding the gut health, there is a huge connection between your gut and your nervous system. So most of us have experienced this. I, I see a hydration slide that I, I missed. So we'll come back to that after we finish that slide. Will you go one more slide, Karen? Okay, great. Um, oops, back one more. Okay, great. All right, so there's this huge, uh, huge intersection between your nervous system and your gut. And many of us have experienced this uh, with the simple, like, I have butterflies in my stomach, right? Or I got punched in my gut. So we have all these sayings that really highlight that connection between the nervous system and the gut. So to have a healthy gut, we really need to have a healthy stress response as well. And so I hate to give you this very generic reduced stress, but I, we didn't have time today to talk about different ways to reduce stress. Certainly we just learned some with breathing techniques and body awareness. So those can be awesome ways to reduce stress. Um, exercise can be another way of doing that, um, making sure that you are uh, talking to people, so friends, family members, things like that, um, journaling. And then I love uh, a technique called emotional freedom technique for a way of dealing with acute stressful moments. Um, so working on different ways to bring stress out of the life, out of your life. So sometimes that's how do we get rid of stress? And then that's how do we manage the stress that we can't get rid of too. Uh, removing GMO foods can be a way to support the gut. So part of the way GMOs work uh, is, is actually through, not, not the foods themselves, but the substances that get used in the GMOs um, work via disrupting the gut, the gut barrier in insects. And so that is certainly going to make a difference in our guts as well. So really encouraging you to move towards that. Uh, and then doing your best to avoid antibiotics. And this isn't about just going for that herbal formula instead of taking an antibiotic, because if you're not setting the foundations, it's just not gonna work that way. I had a patient a couple weeks ago that I've been working for maybe since March, and she was really excited to tell me about the cold that everybody else in the family got and started for her, but didn't go anywhere. And she said, it's the first time that prevention has really worked for her. Or, um, alternative methods for treating it. And that was because she had changed her foundations in her body and her body was better able to avoid needing any extra intervention. So foundations for that are eating well, low inflammatory diets that are low in processed food and high in nutrients, prioritizing sleep, getting lots and lots of sleep and good quality sleep. And then again, that stress front. So stress is such an important uh, modifier too. Okay, could we go back one slide and I'm gonna hop back to hydration, sorry about that. I don't know how I forgot this. So you are drinking your water that has a pinch of sea salt or some minerals, or you're drinking a cup of broth and you're bringing that fluid into your body. The next thing you wanna do is really drive the hydration into your cells. Uh, and you can do that in a number of different ways. So dry skin brushing is an awesome way to do that. Um, this is uh, a technique where you get a natural fiber brush and a lot of these look like old fashioned back scrubbers and you do little strokes on your skin. Um, start at your feet and move up your legs, your, your hands to your arms. Uh, you move everything towards your heart and you know, just 
I, I think this is really helpful for keeping the, the skin healthy in scleroderma. You just want to be really careful if your skin is currently quite tight or you have any little ulcers, you want to be very careful with um, how prickly the brush is on there. Yeah, there are lots of videos on YouTube for dry skin brushing. And I, I like to do this every day and I spend just like a minute or two doing it. It's very quick. I'll do it either before the shower in the morning or before bed at night or both. Some of the videos will say spend 10 or 15 minutes doing it, but I'm never going to do it if I have to do it for 10 or 15 minutes. Sometimes while I'm running a bath, I'll do it for like three to five minutes, but it's better to do a smaller amount of time on a day-to-day -day basis. That's, it's really great for moving lymph. It's really great for circulation. Massage can be a great thing to do, self-massage or professional massage, um, and then anything that activates your fascia. So fascia is this amazing connective tissue that is like a gauzy saran wrap that surrounds every other structure in your body. And it's a continuous network that literally connects your toe to the top of your head um, in, in a continuous fashion there. And fascia is activated by um, stretching actually is the best way to activate fascia. So some of those stretches where we're twisting our whole body that we learned earlier, that's great for getting that whole body fascia action. The wrist twisting is great and you can, um, you know, do that on your whole arm, do it on your ankles and your knees. The head is great to do some rolling. Often I will recommend to people that two or three times during the day, even when you're just sitting at your desk, incorporate a minute or two of these, of these things that move your fascia. And this, that can actually be a great way to, um, that some of my patients have found for decreasing afternoon fatigue is um, drinking, hydrating, and then doing those little stretches can be a great way to just wake up too. Okay, let's go two more slides. So we'll go past the one that we just did. Yep. And the last one thing that I want to talk about, um, this is kind of an oddball in here, but it's been really big in the last couple of years with things that I've been doing with patients and seeing some pretty amazing results. Um, I love breath work as we learned uh, earlier today. I love the alternate nostril breathing. I try to do that most most days before I start with patients so that I'm clear-headed and I'm focused when I start working with people. I teach it to people all the time. Um, but we also want to pay attention, and this was touched on earlier um, by Dr. Sundar, uh, about breathing through the nose, right? And this is, this is really incredibly important. So many people breathe through their mouth during the day chronically. Some people realize it, some people don't. And many people are mouth breathers at night for a variety of reasons. And that can really fuel inflammation in the body. Uh, not only does it fuel inflammation, and you can see this on actually on blood markers, um, but it will decrease oxygenation of your tissues. And that means that you can't heal and you can't produce energy when you're not oxygenating well. So you need to oxygenate well. I'm going to come back to, you know, keeping like digital ulcers and things like that. Um, you're going to have a much better job of healing those if you're oxygenating your tissues really well with that. Um, so breathing, if, if you're a mouth breather during the day, you know, you can ask somebody close to you that sees you all the time if you do that, or maybe you know yourself or you can start observing that. But mouth breathing at night can be a little trickier. Waking with a dry mouth can be a big sign of it. Snoring can be another clue of it. Uh, waking with fatigue. There can be many, many causes of fatigue, but this can be one of them, can be breathing through your mouth at night. Um, so you could do, do a little um, test on that or ask your, your partner or your spouse if you snore or if they've noticed uh, you, you waking or um, mouth breathing at night. Um, in addition to the dry mouth, uh, bad breath in the morning, morning breath can be a sign of mouth breathing too as a, as a result of that dry mouth. Um, so that means you, you want to get at the reason why you're mouth breathing, right? So some of it can just be habits. Uh, allergies can be a big cause and chronic congestion, whether it's allergy driven or otherwise. Um, but I'll give you a big, a big hint about the allergies and congestion because this, in addition to autoimmunity, chronic congestion is something that I specialize in my practice. When you bring down inflammation in the body and you're eating the right diet for you, it, take care, it takes care of a lot of allergies and congestion in and of itself. Even if the allergies are something that we're typically getting seasonally, they will reduce a lot with, with reduction in systemic inflammation. 
and uh, reduction in foods that we're sensitive to. So I often tell people, um, when people mark on their intake that they have allergies, I usually don't worry about doing anything specific for allergies unless they start with me at the height of allergy season. And then I might say, you know, I want you to take um, these herbs and I want you to nasal rinse and things like this. But most of the time when I work on the bigger picture, and again, I get their gut healthy, I get their liver healthy, they're eating right, their inflammation is down, the next season they tell me the allergies are much reduced or they're gone. So that can be a big part in getting us to breathe properly through our nose. Um, same thing with congestion, that can be a big part of it too. Uh, and then sometimes so I'll, I'll work on those in inflammatory factors, their diet. And then I will sometimes also do actually adjustments to their nose and their sinuses to open things up and get things going. But naturopaths have a lot of, a lot of tools in their toolkit for that. Um, we can also get that breathing from a narrow palate, previous dental work. Uh, and sometimes that narrow palate um, will, uh, is, is a result of things early on in life too. Um, and a biological dentist is a great person to have on your team. Um, we know if you're having a reduction in secretions uh, in your mouth from, from some of the things that come along with sclerosis, uh, biological dentists is a really great person to have on your team, and they're good at ad addressing that, those factors in that. Um, okay, I'm going to look at a couple. Okay, I went through that much faster than I thought I would, which is great. I think I got us a little bit closer to back on track. I'm, I'm open to questions. I'm going to look through the responses here. Yes, you can buy tape strips to help with that too, um, or you can simply actually use a piece of surgical tape. But if you are congested or um, have chronic allergies, you're going to want to address those too, because the, the tape won't work unless, unless you can breathe through your nose. Um, Okay, what kinds of questions do people have? I have a question. Great, what's your question? So, and I think these are inflammatory. I love tomatoes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Love them. Yes, yes. So I could eat them almost every day, maybe three, yeah. four times a week. Um, yeah. How do I know if it's contributing to my inflammation? Would yeah. it be joint pain? Would it be like, because my face stays red. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just okay. curious, you know, eating something like tomatoes all the time, where am I, if it is contributing to my inflammation, how am I going to know that? How do you know that? Yeah. One of the tricky things about food sensitivities um, and foods that create inflammation is the inflammatory factors can show up in any system in the body, which is a little bit maddening how it can do that. Uh, joint pain is definitely something that I think about with tomatoes, but I, I have other patients who where it will cause rosacea or it will cause reflux, but truly any system in the body. So I've had people that have had food sensitivities manifest as PMS, right? You would think that's maybe not connected or um, anxiety is another one that I see with food sensitivities a lot. So it can be any system that they appear in. Um, so typically what I recommend is that you eliminate them. And with tomatoes, you could probably eliminate them for maybe as little as a week, but probably a couple weeks and reintroduce. But my caveat with that is if you just eliminate tomatoes, but you're actually reactive to corn and gluten and potatoes and sugar, and you leave all of those in, it may mask your sensitivity to tomatoes because you may still be reacting to them. So that's a conversation that I always have with new patients where it's, I say, you know, we can we can take out just these top things or we can take out things one at a time, but you really may not get a very good um, idea of, of all the things that are inflammatory for you. And one of the hard things about autoimmune conditions is usually in the beginning, there are a lot of things that are going to cause inflammation for you when you first eliminate them. But that doesn't mean it's forever. So I'm thinking of a young woman that I saw when I first started my practice with rheumatoid arthritis and uh, she she uh, was so inflamed that it took her a couple hours to get out of bed in the morning. And we put her on an elimination diet and she improved tremendously in terms of being able to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And 
now she includes a lot of those foods in her diet and 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 they're fine for her but in the beginning they were a really big problem until we got her body back into balance but okay what other questions do you accept medicare i don't i don't um i actually don't do any insurance billing in my practice does yeah. any of the doctors in your type of services yeah, it, it depends a little bit from state to state, um, what people do and what they accept with it. Yeah. Okay. So you, you just you just have to call around. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. This is Karen. We have a question from Alexandra. Um, do you have n nutrition recommendations for depression? Yeah. So that's a big, that's a big category, but we know that depression actually can be really modified with bringing inflammation down in the body. Um, with, uh, with depression, so I do think about increasing the good gut bacteria. Again, you know, being careful with that um, risk factor of, of SIBO with it, but eating the fermented foods, there have been some good studies on different yogurts modifying depression. Um, I don't know that I would ever prescribe just a yogurt alone as, a, as something for depression, um, but sometimes the inflammatory foods too. So I know for me, um, one of the ways that gluten bothers me is actually with my mood. I can feel much more in a depressive state with that in my diet. Uh, it's quite inflammatory to the nervous system with that. Um, the other thing that I would say with both depression and anxiety is really having a protein rich diet can be quite helpful. Um, so especially prioritizing good proteins and good fats in the morning and really decreasing the amount of heavy carbohydrates that we're getting in the morning, which is really like the opposite of what we do on a standard American diet where we're like carb heavy in the morning with cereals and bagels and things like that, but focusing on good fats and proteins and throughout the day keeping your blood sugar stable with those, the fats, the proteins, and then um, lower carb fruits and veggies. And then at night, at night, um, having a baked potato or a baked sweet potato can actually be really helpful um, with neurotransmitters and whatnot too. And that can be a really, really simple approach to it. Debbie asks, um, I was told turmeric and ginger is bad for GERD. Um, I have not seen that, you know, I've not really seen that much in my practice and every individual is going to be a little bit different in terms of foods that might make reflux worth worse with that. So if you suspect it, take it out and then reintroduce it and see with it. Um, yeah. And um, they wanted to know where the, your elimination diet is available. Yeah, so if you go to my website, which is healingrootsclinic.com, it'll actually pop up as a pop-up. And to get it, you, you have to sign up for the newsletter, but if you, one, I don't send out newsletters very often, so I'm not gonna flood your inbox. It's like every few months. Um, but also you can just um, unsubscribe from it if you don't wanna receive that, but you'll get the elimination diet that I use. And it's based on an anti-inflammatory paleo diet, but I do some more lenient recommendations in that based on what I found to be most important in my practice. And Melissa asks, do you find sal saliva hormone tests helpful in your practice? Um, I don't run saliva hormone tests a lot. I will usually use blood levels or sometimes dried urine samples. Um, with that, that's sort of a personal preference and style. I will sometimes measure cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone through the saliva um, or the urine. And I do like that because you can measure it at different pinpoints during the day and cortisol changes throughout the day with a natural rhythm. Um, but mostly for things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, I'm either using blood work or a dried urine test for that. Yeah. She said, thank you. Yeah, great. <laughs> Any recommendations on how to care um, for face skin against red areas itching? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first, I would say with any kind of skin stuff, you want to start internally with that, with bringing inflammation down again. I know I sound like a, a broken record, but bringing down that internal inflammation is going to help the skin tremendously. But in terms of topically, um, one, 
actually reducing the amount, the harshness and the amount of times that you're washing can be really helpful. So with redness and, and areas of dryness, I'll often recommend an oil cleansing method where you're actually massaging oil into the face and steaming it off and then reapplying a moisturizer and an oil. And that keeps a lot of irritants off the skin because so many of our beauty products have chemicals in it that are irritating to the skin and uh, not great for autoimmunity in general. So keeping things very simple with uh, face oils and whatnot is a great way to go. Um, emu oil, EMU specifically, that's not a brand, that's a type of oil um, that can be really healing for uh, inflamed skin as well. That's a great way to go with that. Um, she said that she heard um, ret retinic oil or retinic acid helps? Um, I don't use it much with people. I think it's a little bit too harsh with that. Um, Melissa says, I have two skin issues and completely removing all nightshades from my mm -hmm. diet helped me incredibly. Yeah, yeah. That's a great story of how taking out the internal will help with the external for sure. Yeah. Um, Madalena says, how about hemp oil? Um, not one of the top ones that I think about for skin. Um, I, again, usually think about the emu oil. Um, with that, uh, almond oils can be great. Jojoba oils can be really good. You can spot treat with um, a vitamin E oil or a, ca a carrot seed oil can be great too for, for um, I'm not saying hemp oil is necessarily bad. It's just not one that I've used much therapeutically with people. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Jane asks, is there, um, do you know of any naturopaths in the Omaha area? No, I actually get a lot of people from Nebraska <laughs> that will come for appointments. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you can you can check out um, the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians has listings. And I don't think Nebraska has a naturopathic association, but you can uh, you can check that. You can Google and see if they have a naturopathic association that lists people. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rose asks, um, what about coconut oil and tea tree oil? Yeah. So coconut oil can be a great simple moisturizer. That's a great one for the whole body uh, for different people. Um, tea tree oil you want to be careful with. Uh, I wouldn't use it just across the board as a body oil or to bring down inflammation because it's it's really strong and tea, straight tea tree oil can burn the skin or burn mucous membranes um, because it's so strong with that. So when you use it topically, you almost always want to dilute it if you do that. And I would use it more like occasional have people spot treat acne with it, um, but I'm very careful with using that topically unless it's very diluted. And Carol's got her hand raised. Carol. Okay. Hi, Carol. Hi. Uh, somebody already asked in the chat, but the pickle, the, the oh. fermented, that you gave the, a brand name? Yes, the brand is Bubby. What is that? Bubby's. B U B B I E S. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Enos, for joining us. And You're I, welcome. I, I, apologize I apologize about the screen share. I, I, um, my laptop went, so I'm on my daughter's. Oh, <laughs> great. We both had technical difficulties, but it worked out, I think. I, I hope it wasn't too much of a fire hose of information without the slides. But <laughs> thank you all. Thank you for your great questions and um, be well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. Shout out to all of our fantastic speakers. And um, thank you for joining the Heartland Chapter Education Day. Um, we will, uh, we have recorded all the doctor's talks and we will be um, publishing them next week. And I have everyone's list of who attended. So I'll be sending out an email where, where those will be out. So thank you, everybody. And have a great weekend.